Hi, I'm Nicola White, I'm a mudlark and artist and I'm here today at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. The British Antarctic Survey is a world leading centre for polar research and I'm here with Dr Ella Gilbert who is a climate scientist and science presenter. Ella, thank you very much for having me here today to talk to me. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do at the British Antarctic Survey, please? Which, by the way, I and um, a lot of my viewers have heard of because a little while back there was a survey to name the RRS, Sir, um, Sir David Attenborough, and it ended up being called, well, they wanted to call it Boaty McBoatface, didn't they? So the I don't people. know. The people yeah. wanted the... to call it Boaty McBoatface, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it didn't turn out like that. So they did have a little Boaty McBoatface, didn't they? Named on the boat a little submarine. But So you may have heard of the British Antarctic Survey because of that. But, but what do you do here? So I'm a climate scientist and I spend a lot of my time trying to unravel the mysteries of what's going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic and also trying to kind of project using my crystal ball into the future to imagine what might happen in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 100 years uh, in terms of the climate, the weather, clouds, all these things in the Ar Antarctic and the Arctic. So why are the polar regions important? It seems sometimes with the polar regions that they're like super far away, they're the ends of the earth, they're so remote and distant from our kind of everyday lived experience. But ultimately the polar regions affect us, all of us, no matter where we live, because of their impact on our climate particularly. So the polar regions have huge amounts of fresh water. Um, they impact our fresh water resources, for instance, glaciers in mountains are a really important source of water for billions of people around the world. And of course, having a cold, frozen Arctic and Antarctic is very, very important for maintaining sea levels where they are and also for keeping our planet the nice stable temperature that we've grown accustomed to. Why are glaciers melting and what happens when they melt? So glaciers are I guess a first a definition, they're these kind of frozen rivers of ice and we get glaciers up mountains for instance but we also get glaciers in the polar region, so the Arctic and the Antarctic where they flow down off the steep ice caps if you like um, and they're really important because they contribute to people's water resources for instance in the Himalayas um, or the Alps, other mountain regions around the world but also they have this kind of natural cycle of growth and decay and it's a really important component of how our planetary system, how our climate functions. So what are the different types of ice that you get in the polar regions? Yeah so I guess we often imagine that there's just ice and actually there is a huge variety when it comes to the polar regions. So I guess I would like to think of maybe six different types. Um, so we've got the ice sheets which are what you might traditionally think of as ice caps. So the ice cap in Greenland or the ice cap on Antarctica. And then flowing down from those are glaciers, which are these like frozen rivers of ice. Where they meet the oceans around the edges of Antarctica or Greenland, for instance, you get these floating platforms or tongues of ice called ice shelves. Um, bits of those ice shelves then break away into the oceans and that's icebergs. So you would have heard of that, of Titanic fame, etc. cetera. Um, and then we've also got sea ice, which floats on top of the ocean and it's much thinner. Um, and then you also get permafrost in regions of the polar regions that are on land. So permafrost is soil that's permanently frozen and permanent is just more than two years. So those are six broad types of ice, but they're all really different and really important in different ways for our climate and also for maintaining the, the environment of the polar regions in general. So does the melting ice affect weather patterns? Yes, it's the short answer, but <laughs> so in slightly different ways. So we have sea ice, which floats in the Arctic, um, and that's a really important component of our Arctic. So the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, whereas the Antarctic is the opposite. It's a frozen continent surrounded by ocean. But in the Arctic, we have this huge area of sea ice which is floating very thin it keeps our planet very cool because it acts like a kind of mirror it reflects the sun's energy straight back to space unfortunately because of climate change and temperatures rising we're losing that at a very rapid rate um, and we think 
that the loss of this sea ice is starting to impact the weather and climate of the northern hemisphere essentially. Um, so you may have heard of the jet stream which is this really strong band of winds high up in the atmosphere that can impact our weather. For example if you get really wiggly jet stream we can have really cold conditions in the UK. Um, similarly you get the same in North America and when we lose sea ice there's some suggestion that that might start to impact where the jet stream goes and how our weather makes itself known, particularly in winter. You either get very cold conditions or in some cases you can get very hot heat wave conditions. So that's one way. Um, the other way is that melting ice that enters the ocean, for example, from glaciers or melting ice sheets, that adds, to, adds fresh water to the ocean. Obviously the ocean is normally quite salty, so you're changing the balance of how salty the ocean is. And our ocean currents, which take heat and energy and nutrients all over the world. Um, they are driven by temperature and saltiness, salinity differences. So having more fresh water in the ocean impacts those currents and it can either weaken or strengthen them, um, which has a knock-on effect on our weather. The melting glaciers, how does that impact on wildlife and communities? So with glaciers, when you have a happy, healthy glacier, you have a summer where it will start melting, you have a, that's compensated in winter when you have lots of snowfall. And when you have a healthy glacier, the summertime melting will often be a really important source of water, drinking water, irrigation for agriculture, etc. in mountain regions. So for instance, uh, two billion people depend in some way on the Himalayan region for their water. Um, so having a m lots more melting and not enough snowfall to replenish those glaciers means that those people who depend on those resources are getting too much water at one time. So you're getting floods. Um, in Pakistan, the floods in 2022 were partly related to uh, glacial melting earlier in the year. Uh, you see bridges washed away by these really crazy floods that happen really quickly. Um, and at the same time, you've got too little water because you're losing all of that water at once. So it's a less reliable source of water resources. So you've got both too much and too little, which is a problem in both, both ways. Um, and then also if we've got melting ice in the polar regions, for example, people who live in the Arctic, uh, less sea ice means that you have less capacity to travel over your sea ice. You have changing hunting grounds where you might go and catch your normal uh, hunting animals. Um, it impacts the reindeer that can, where they can forage. And of course, we all know about the sad uh, polar bear stereotype, the image of yeah. the polar bear swimming out into the open ocean where there's no sea ice. All of this has really profound impacts on the wildlife, but also on the people who live in the regions. Gosh, and have you actually visited the Antarctic? I've been very lucky. I've been to both the Arctic and the Antarctic and it's such a privilege and an honour and such a mind-blowing experience, honestly. I can absolutely imagine. And have you seen, I was looking up earlier because I wasn't sure if polar bears lived in the Antarctic, but they don't, do they? They're in the Arctic, I've learnt that. Um, but have you seen any penguins? No, I'm quite glad I've never seen any polar bears. Um, I've been <laughs> very close to a very big polar bear print, but that's the closest I've ever been. Um, I have seen some penguins. They're wonderful. They're very sassy and up for getting involved. Uh, they're charming, you could say. <laughs> oh, excellent. I would love to see a penguin in the wild, I have to say. Um, thanks so much for giving all this, this explanation and I wanted to mention that you do have an excellent YouTube channel called Dr Gilbs and what I particularly love about it is that you can tell that you're really passionate about communicating climate science to people that aren't scientists making it accessible for everybody and it's quite a difficult subject. I've learned so much during the course of these interviews I've been doing recently. So if you get an opportunity please do go over and take a look at Ella's YouTube channel which is Dr Gilb's Climate Science Made Easy. So for you and your children it's a brilliant channel. I've really enjoyed watching it. 
Your last video I really enjoyed, you were talking about why we should care about the polar regions and it, you broke it down so well. But also you were talking about a series which you'd narrated which looked absolutely fascinating called Lifting... The... Lift the Ice, yeah, yeah. Lift the Ice. And so do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, no, it's a really cool docu-series. It's a six-parter for Curiosity Stream. Um, and myself and five other experts present the shows uh, where we go and kind of uncover the mysteries that are hidden beneath the ice, um, from things like alien life to potential cures to diseases that are hidden inside glaciers, um, finding potential positive solutions to climate change, uh, old war artefacts like there's so much there's such a huge range of cool stuff hidden beneath the ice that we just need to lift it up to find out about oh brilliant and actually before we end on that topic it's always good to look at solutions isn't it do you have any advice for people on what they can do little actions they can take to combat the climate crisis i think the number one thing that we can all do is getting is using our, making our voice heard so whether that's voting or taking a placard on the street or writing to your MP or signing a petition like getting involved in a campaign that can help make change happen and help to make your voice one of many that pushes things towards solutions brilliant thank you very much for having me here today it's been excellent talking to it's you it's been a pleasure <laughs> I think that went pretty well, really. I think we uh, managed to break the ice. Yeah, I'm really glad we made it through without cryoing. There are a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, but they totally slipped my mind. Nightmare, it absolutely happens all the time like that. <laughs> but I hope you really do have a, an ice day. Stay cool. <laughs>